right, good morning. Quick announcement before we get on to introducing our speaker. Um, welcome to today's diversity presentation. Four sign-ins, because um, if you're using this as your diversity <coughs> event for the year, we will need you to sign in to make it easier since it's such a large crowd. We're gonna start clipboards down at the far end of training room A and just pass them along your row and sign in. Print legibly. If I cannot read your name, you're not gonna be able to get credit for this, so please print. Uh, and you're, we ask for your department alongside of it in case I have to kind of go figure it out that way, but please make it easy for us in HR. Um, so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Gita, who's going to introduce our speaker. Thank you, this is one of our bigger crowds for our diversity event, so welcome. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be able to introduce Ken Barlow to all of you today. Now, many of you have heard or seen Ken as a meteorologist on TV, but he's a professor of broadcast meteorology at St. Cloud University. But I think for today, the real important part is he has been a very strong spokes spokesperson out in the community because he lives with bipolar disease. And last week I happened to be on a panel at a nonprofit health plan um, organization meeting about mental health. And at the end of the day, the biggest issue that we were struggling with is the issue of stigma. People don't treat mental illness and substance abuse in the same way in this environment as they do if a person has congestive heart failure or hypertension. And what is incredibly important is Ken as a public person has been able to come out and show that he can talk about his illness and be a real role model for others to be able to be comfortable talking themselves. So um, please join me in giving Ken a welcome, a you care welcome today to speak about his experience. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> First of all, Christine, where did she go? So I spent five minutes with you, so that's enough. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for the invitation, I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you all for coming down on such a gloriously sunny day. Um, we are going to discuss a little bit about the stigma stuff, because before I came forward with what I had publicly, I lived with it for five years, terrified that somebody would find out, um, especially in this business, where you know, we're all perfect, look at us, <laughs> right? The CV station makes you, make you seem that way. You, you perfect clothes, you're perfect this, you're perfect that, uh, perfect hair, used to be perfect hair. But <laughs> it's, it's all kind of a, a, a not a real thing. It's, it's, it's all, what people do, I guess, in public is people walk around generally and you don't know what's inside, right? You don't know. And that's the never judge a book by its cover thing. So the way I want to do this is tell you how this started for me. And it started back in the dark ages, in the 1980s, uh, for some of you. My wife and I were boyfriend and girlfriend at the time, going to college in New Hampshire. And everything was great. And then I started to feel a little too much energy. I was also, I mean, in college, a lot of times you drink a lot. I was able to drink a lot and not feel drunk. I could just go, and I was laughing, I was having a great time, I didn't need any sleep. I'd run eight miles, I'd come back and I'd have a cheese sandwich and that'd be it for the day. Um, I'd get great grades without even really trying. It, I said, finally, at 20 years old, this is what college is supposed to be like, not the past two years of struggle. Well, this went on for about two weeks and my girlfriend, now wife, said to me, are you feeling okay? And I said, what do you mean I feel great? This is the best thing ever. She said, no, I mean, how do you, how do you feel? <laughs> she didn't, back in 1983 when this was going on, it wasn't so much a thing that people talked about. We didn't talk about mental illness that much at all. So she wasn't getting to that point, but she just meant, she thought I had a brain tumor because she thought there was something physically wrong with my brain because I had so much energy. And I said, you know, I am a little dizzy, not spinning room dizzy, but I feel like um, buzzed a, a lot of the time. So 
when she got me focusing on that, that's all I could think about. So a couple of days later, we went to the campus doctor and he sent me up for a brain scan, which at the time was an EEG where they put pins in your head. So they put a bunch of pins in my head and I lay there, a nervous wreck, I'm 20 years old, and in a weird way, I was hoping to find out what it was. It's like in a perverse way, I was hoping it was some kind of a thing going on that they could see. Well, he came back and he said, you know, nothing's wrong, your, your brain scan's fine. I said, no, something is wrong. This is not the way I'm, I am, this is weird. The past two and a half, three weeks have been something really different than what I usually am. And again, he's, he just kind of sent me on my way. Somehow I got out of that, I don't know how, but somehow I came down, because I wasn't really thinking about it. And I still don't think about that part of it, I just think about the high part. I don't think about what did I do to get out of that, because I really don't think I did anything, I think I just kind of eased out of it. Um, so anyway, Teresa and I got married, my wife's name's Teresa. We got married in 1984, and we were really young, and about 10 years went on. We had kids, we had two kids, things were great. I had a job at Care 11 at the time. Everything was really good. And then one day I couldn't get out of bed. I seriously felt like a truck hit me. I wasn't sad, hang on one sec, sorry. I wasn't sad or anything, but I was definitely, I didn't care kind of thing. Um, Lethargic. I hate that sound when people do that, sorry. <laughs> uh, so I just laid there and I thought, what is going on? I don't know, I don't care about anything. I don't want to go to work. I don't care about Teresa, that I'm like sitting here thinking about her, the kids. I really don't have the energy to think about it. So I laid there, but I had to go to work at two o'clock because I was doing nights at Care 11. And somehow I got up and I went in the shower, which the water felt like pins, needles hitting me. It's one of the things I'll always remember about that. So I thought I had something going on again with my head. Well, I did, but I didn't know what it was. So after a couple of days of this, I went to my doctor and I said, this is what's happening. I have no energy. I'm a runner and I can't run. I can't even get the hell out of bed. I can't do anything. So he said, after examining me, it was August. He said, well, I think you have a August grass allergy. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'd never had before or since. Um, so he gave me an inhaler and sent me home. So I tell people the good news is I could breathe really easily while laying in bed. <laughs> but the bad news is I still didn't have a diagnosis of what was wrong. Of course, I never thought to relate it to what went on back in the early 80s. I never thought that. Because I didn't know anything about mental illness or any of that stuff. Why did I need to know? Not that I didn't care, I just didn't know. So, again, somehow I get out of that. Um, it turns out that the days get really sh much shorter at the end of August during the state fair. So the sun sets earlier, or almost by the day, you can tell. And I was getting depressed, falling into a depression, and didn't know it. So again, it went on for a while, at least a week or two, before I finally felt like myself. I would go to work, I'd do the weather, and then I'd go back to my weather office and put my head down on my desk and want to die. And nobody at work knew, because I didn't know how to explain it. I didn't know what it was. So that somehow went away. And now, fast forward to 2005, another big event. My father passed away. And my wife and I, we're from out east in New England. We decided, um, yeah, maybe this was time to go back to see our parents. They're getting older. And 
You know how that is. Maybe you don't yet, but you will. Uh, so we made the really hard decision to take a job in Boston, which was offered to me. I didn't look for it. They offered me a job, and I said, oh my God, this is weird. This is God saying, go home and see your mom. So I did. And while I was out there, Teresa was still here with our three kids, one in college and my two girls uh, finishing school. I would fly back and forth every weekend, which A, is very expensive, <laughs> and B, was very tiring. But I didn't feel tired. This is 2006 now. I'm going back and forth every weekend. I feel like I'm, pardon the expression, king shit. I'm king of the world. I'm just doing anything I want to out east. I'm only eating yogurt. Who needs food? I'm going to go run eight miles or 10 miles. I don't care. And I got on TV and I'd be, oh my God, look at you. I looked fantastic to me. I flew back home and my wife said, what happened to you? I said, what do you mean, what happened to me? Look at this. I had lost, I weigh 165 now. I was like 150 then. And I was all sunk in and gaunt and just looking back at pictures now, I see it. But back then, I looked so great. My job was great. My marriage was great. My kids were great. Everything was the best. So I had this grandiosity thing. So I mean, I didn't know it. Then, Teresa made me promise that when I got back to Boston, that I would see a doctor, which I did. And she directed me to a neurosurgeon. I went to the neurosurgeon, and she put me in a tube, um, gave me the whole scan, and I said, okay, I'm going to get an answer now because this is, I remember this before. This happened before. It was college. So now I know there's something going on. Physically, like a, like a, like a tumor or something. I've got to have something to explain this. It's too weird. So I got in the, in the scan and I, and I remember going home because it takes a long time to read it. I don't know why. <laughs> Some of you know why. I don't. So I'm just waiting at home thinking, I'm, okay, I'm dying. How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? You know, you start thinking terrible things when it's too much time to think. And a week later, her office called and said, we have your results in the MRI. Would you please come in? and we'll talk about them. I was like, oh, this is great, because if there's nothing on it, they would just say, there's nothing, click. But she's bringing me in, which means they found something. I know it sounds weird. They found out what's going on. Well, I got there, and she said, great news, your MRI was clean. I said, no, it wasn't. <laughs> and she said, you have vertigo. I said, OK, first of all, what is vertigo? She said, it's when you're, when you're dizzy, it's hard to walk. And I said, I said no, no, that's not the kind of dizzy I mean. I'm not like head spinning dizzy. I'm like buzz dizzy. OK, bye bye. She gave me my pills, and I went. Two nights later, I collapsed at home. I hadn't, since my dad died, I realized it was making me depressed to drink. So I had a, had a drink like in a year and a half, just voluntarily. That night, for some reason, I had to have a glass of wine because I wanted to bring myself down. It's all I could think about, bring myself down. So I, was, I had a glass of wine, and I started to feel terrible. I, I literally felt my eyes roll back in my head. I grabbed the phone and called Teresa. I said, S something's not right, something's going up, boom. Imagine Teresa here, and I'm 1,200 miles away, passing out on the floor or whatever was going on. She didn't know. I open my eyes and I look up and there's a fireman standing there with an ax. <laughs> I said, what are you doing? They had to bust in my garage door, my utility door, to get into the house. He saw the wine which had spilled, the firefighter, and he looked down and he said, oh, he's just a drunk. <laughs> and they turned around and started to walk away. And I, re I remember being so out of it and looped as I thought, well, maybe I am. 
but I didn't drink that much. I had one glass. So I started to follow him as best I could. And I said, wait, wait, wait. As he was leaving, my brother-in-law, who happened to live nearby, remember, because I said we lived out there, grew up out there, he came walking in, he looked at me and said, we're going to the hospital. He knew immediately when he looked at me, something was wrong. Thank God, because he took me to the hospital. The last thing I remember was sitting in the, sitting in the waiting room. I opened my eyes and Teresa's at the foot of my bed. I said, how did you get here so fast? She said, it's been a week. So, did you ever see the Twilight Zone? The spinning thing? I felt like I was falling down a well on one of those things. I was like, what? Because I'd never really been sick. I'd never been, I had pneumonia once when I was a kid. I broke a wrist. I had knee surgery from being stupid running. But I never really was sick sick. And here I am, I lost a week because I was in some kind of a comatose thing. So she tried to explain to me, and by the way, while you were laying there speaking with us, which I still don't remember, you told the psychiatrist, the psychologist, the, you know, the therapist, and me what had been going on, which I knew she said, and you have bipolar disorder. And I said, what is that? I don't even know what it is. So she said, remember when you were really up? That's, that's when you were manic. That's one part of bipolar. And the other part is when you get down so low that you can't get out of bed. That's depression. And you, and you have that. And I was so mad. I was so mad. Because they had me on so many drugs to try to bring me down that I don't remember a lot of what happened that second week either. <laughs> Is that your baby? Okay, I just want to say right now, that's the funniest damn thing that's ever happened. <laughs> and I've spoken to thousands of people. Well, no one's ever had a laughing baby. <laughs> Did you get that on tape? <laughs> Thank you for that. That was really nice. And well needed. Thank you. Um, so anyway, you don't want to hear my ring. We then went forward in the hospital and the doctor said you have to have a therapist and a psychiatrist before you can leave here. And I was still angry. I was so mad. I called my mother and I said, Mom, they said I have bipolar disorder. She said, oh, Dad had that. I said, what? Why did you say it like that? <laughs> Well, dad, was, dad died when he was 68. And he was diagnosed when he was 60. He had it his whole life. Ups and downs and really bad things. Lost jobs, couldn't hold a job. We lived in a project most of the time because he couldn't hold a job. Five boys, the Barlow boys, were kind of mad at him because he couldn't hold a job. Now we got it. Now I got it. And I kind of said, is that hereditary? <laughs> and the doctor said, yes, it can be. Not all of your four brothers will get it like you do. And they haven't. Don't. I'm the lucky one. <laughs> um, but chances are one of you, because it's a one in, one in four, one in five people have a mental illness just right in our family. There's one in five boys. One of you is at least probably going to get it. And I did. So then I, just, then I just thought it was a really weird thing to hear because I thought I knew my dad really well. And then I thought after he died, I remember when we went to his dresser to um, empty it because mom couldn't do it, I remember finding lithium. And I thought, 
That's really great. Jeff, what's this? <laughs> to my brother. None of us knew, so I just put it back in the, in the box as we were moving away, uh, moving her out. And I never thought of it until I was diagnosed. That's what the theme is because that's what I'm taking. That's one of the things they're giving me in the hospital is lithium. So, which makes you really thirsty, excuse me. <laughs> the good thing is you get your sanity. The bad thing is you're thirsty as hell. So I left the hospital with my wife and got home and immediately went to my laptop and I said, famous people with bipolar disorder, <laughs> enter. And Winston Churchill popped up. And I said, well, that's, that's pretty cool, right? I mean, he helped save the world. And then I looked again, it was Ben Stiller, one of my favorite comedians, Meet the Parents, hilarious. And then I went down again, it was Britney Spears. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, two out of three ain't bad. So she is doing fantastic, by the way. Um, she doesn't need my blessing, but the joking aside, at the time, she was going through that weird stage where she shaved her head and dyed it orange and did all this, and people were like, what is going on with her? And then we found out later that's what she had. So that happened. Then we get the newspaper, and it was the Boston Globe, and I remember the headline, the banner headline said, mentally ill woman kills kids. It was a, and I met, I met through time, I've met the family. The daughter of this family was 30, and she had bipolar disorder, and she went off her meds and walked her niece and nephew onto the highway. And I said, oh my God, I'm gonna be a killer. Seriously, because then you hear about all the, all the attacks in the convenience stores, all the supermarkets, the robberies. Someone so robbed the store today and the police said he had a mental illness. Police said he had bipolar disorder. Police said. So then I started to shrivel up and I took dad's cue and I said, I'm supposed to be ashamed of this. Because I'm usually a very outgoing person, but I just shut up and didn't say a word to anybody. I didn't even tell one of my brothers for six months. I was so embarrassed. So we leave, that was 2007. When we left, uh, that's when I was diagnosed. We left Massachusetts in 2010 and got here in 11. And I didn't tell anybody here. There was no reason to. Mostly because I was terrified that people would find out I think people do in every job, but in one in particular is when you're on TV because people already kind of judge you, which is fine, that's what we get paid for. But I didn't want it to judge me like that. Uh, so I didn't want people to know that I had anything wrong. Teresa would go to Walgreens and get my prescriptions for me because I was so afraid people would see me going into the drugstore 10 times a month or whatever it is. Because of course they figured out I had bipolar disorder if they saw Teresa getting pills. I mean, it was a, it's a stupid thought, right? But at the time it made perfect sense to me. So she would get my prescriptions for me. We, we created this wall that we'd keep everybody else out like a castle. And our families and not even my best friends knew. And then I felt like I had to do something because uh, for the cause because I felt like I had this name that maybe I could help people, but not by telling them about me, but by just helping them. So I called Nami and I said, hi, my name is Ken Barlow and I talk on TV. What do you want me to do? I'll do it, whatever you want to help. And she said, oh, would you like to host the walk that we have? I said, well, what's that? She said, well, you get about 4,500 people, and they walk to end the stigma. I said, perfect. Not planning ever on saying anything. Then the walk day came, and I was standing there, and I asked my mom if I could tell Dad's story. I said, can I tell Dad's story? Because I'm not, not going to tell mine. She said, she said, of course, it's okay. 
So I told my dad's story and I was gonna end it and it's like the signs were talking to me. They said, stop the stigma, stop the lie, <laughs> stop the this, stop the that, mentally ill people are people too. I mean, just things that I was thinking, signs were talking to me. And Christine said, some of you were there um, that day, <laughs> which was such a weird thing because all of a sudden I just said, but the story doesn't end there. <laughs> And I said that I had bipolar disorder. And everybody clapped. And I know, and I said, well, if I know that was gonna happen, I'd have done it five years ago. <laughs> what was I worried about? These people love me with bipolar disorder. Uh, but I understood why. It's because they were there to support people who had it, and they understood, I think, more than I did what I was actually doing at the time. I know that when I got in the car and called Teresa, she wanted to kill me. What? You did that without me? You didn't even talk to me about it. That took a while for her, and I don't blame her. It took a while for her to come down because she was, and by the way, Teresa is 4'10", but don't mess with her. <laughs> so eventually she, she came to know. I told my boss, who was very receptive, very understanding. Uh, they, uh, Pioneer Press called and wanted to do an article, and I said, I said, okay, let me just ask my boss. And they said, oh, sure, go ahead. Well, I thought it would be this little corner thing on page four. It was the banner headline. <laughs> Ken Barlow, I'm not alone. I'm like, oh my God, what did I do? I created a monster. <laughs> so I started getting emails. And I started getting 10 emails. And I started getting 20 and 30 and four. And seriously, I've lost track now. It's over 1,000 over the past, how many years it's been? Six years in September. And I've answered every one of them myself um, because what they were saying was so amazing. They were saying, they weren't saying you're a great guy, which is amazing by the way, <laughs> if you all want to say that. Um, they all said, you know what? This is what my dad had, I get it. My brother has it, now I understand what he's going through. I have it, thank you, now I don't feel so bad. And I kept hearing this, I get goosebumps again. I kept hearing the same things over and over again. And I went to a, a church where they held this meeting down in Lakeville, Hosanna Church. It's like a mega mall. They've got their own coffee shop, they've got everything. So they asked me to come speak, and we expected 100 people, 500 people showed up. Not because it was me, but because it was me who has this talking about this. Because they have questions too. It's almost like all of us want to be reassured about the way we are. I want to be reassured, that's why I looked up Britney Spears. <laughs> I wanted to make sure I wasn't the only one, that there were actually semi-normal people out there not robbing banks and doing awful things um, on the highway. So uh, it was just such a mixed up time that all of this seemed to make sense now. This is what I'm supposed to do. You know, you're supposed to have this thing in life that you're meant to do. This is what I was meant to do. And I don't mean that in a glorious way, I just mean I know because when I talk about this, I get such a reaction from families and people who have it or who have relatives who have it or a mental illness. They're just so thankful and kind. The one that stands out most in my head is when I was at Lakeville North High School. Um, I live in Maple Grove. I don't know why Lakeville plays such a big thing in my life, but um, they invited me to speak, the same people that put on the church, they invited me to speak to the kids at Lakeville North. And again, it was a free period. These 15, 16 to 18 year olds could have been doing anything. And they came, not because teenagers watch the news and know who I am, but they want to hear about this topic. And one girl, I never get through this. Hold on. It'll take a minute. I have a son and two daughters. My son is 30. He's a professor at the University of Iowa. 
just got married. My other daughter is a nurse, 28 years old, and my other one goes to Iowa, and she's going to save the world, and she's 20. <laughs> okay, now that I heard laughing, I can say this. This girl stood up when I said any questions and said, I have something. I said, yes, and I, I, I don't even remember her name, honestly, but I remember her, her impact, and I can see her face. She looked at all of these kids, all these peers of hers, and she said, my name is Jenny, or whatever, and I have anxiety and I have depression. See? And the kids, the kids who are sometimes, a lot of times, a pain, all stood up and clapped for her. And that was the first time she had ever said that out loud. So it's things like that that make me realize that this is what I'm supposed to do. Because these kids embraced her. And then maybe some of those other kids felt better about talking about it. And they felt better in their own lives. And they could tell somebody else who has a problem maybe that it's OK. Because this girl, she stood up in front of 400 fellow students, which is braver than I've ever done, knowing how kids are, and told them that she has a mental illness. And I was just blown away by that. And then I've done other talks, and I go to places, and these things stand out. This uh, teenage boy, I think he was teenage, maybe barely teenage, 18, 19, he came up to me and he said, can I shake your hand? And I said, yeah, sure, how's it going? And uh, he said, he leaned over and he said, I just want you to know you saved my life. So, I'm also sleep deprived. <laughs> I'm a crier. I still get up at one in the morning. And these kids are amazing. And he hugged me and I've never seen him again, never heard from him again. But I tell people, if that's the only thing that I maybe have done, he saved his own life, but to give me any kind of credit like that. Or this the girl at Lakeville North, to feel comfortable because I spoke there, I, I think I'm doing okay. I think that proves this is what I'm supposed to be doing. The suicide rate among teenagers is so high, as you most of you know. Um, and a lot of it has to do with being embarrassed because they may have a, a mental illness and they're worried about the stigma. So we have, what I'm doing is I try to talk to as many people, I don't really care how old they are, um, and just tell them, I'm telling you I have bipolar disorder. You wouldn't know that looking at me. You might think, oh, he's a little crazy on TV sometimes, but you know what I mean? You can't diagnose somebody looking at them. I don't know who in here may have high cholesterol or heart disease or may have had or has cancer. It's the same thing. That's what I tell these people, kids especially, that nobody is better than anybody else. Because I'm on TV doesn't make me better than you. You know why? because I've got stuff going on here. I am just like you or just like your friend or your husband or your wife. We are all the same. Nobody is better than anybody else. You don't know what people are hiding. You don't know what they're terrified of. Maybe they have a bad marriage. Maybe their house is being foreclosed on. I mean, you see what I mean? All these issues that we have in life most people don't wear them on their sleeve and walk around. And I tell them the same thing. Don't feel like you have to walk around like I do and talk about it. I just want you to be comfortable with yourself and know that just because the jock in high school doesn't have, that you know of, a mental illness doesn't make him better than you. Or I tell the jock, just because the yearbook editor <laughs> doesn't have a, you know, a mental illness, doesn't make her better than you. 
it sounds so easy and so ordinary, but it really is hard to, to, to think that way for people. So I don't even know how many of these, I think this is my 73rd talk or something since um, coming out, so to speak, but I didn't do it for that reason. I didn't think, I'm going to go around the country and talk about this. I did it because it's what I had to do. But in doing that, it became kind of a mission that I don't want people hiding in castles like I did. I don't want people to be embarrassed about going into Walgreens. There's no reason to do that. And if you can look at me on TV, and I'm saying this because some people say they do, and say it makes them feel better, they see somebody doing something like that, they don't feel so odd or different, I think that's fantastic. So I don't do as many of these as I did in the four years, five years previous, because it's really, um, I found out that it really does um, bring up a lot of stuff, a lot of um, people that I may have hurt in the past, who, by the way, have told me they totally get it, but still, you feel like a jerk. Um, so this is, a, this is my first one since December when I talked to the Police Chiefs Association. So thank you again for, for inviting me. I think we, we're going to have time for questions, right? Questions, if anybody has any. Thank you all, by the way. In case there's no questions. So do we have any questions? So it sounds like your kids were a little bit older at the time that you got diagnosed, but in the time that you've been talking about this and learning, did you come up, have you come across any tips to explain this to kids? Well, my, my daughter who is, who is 20 was nine, nine at the time. I'm not here to math. Um, she was nine at the time, um, so she was young. My wife did that while I was in the hospital. She was just perfectly honest with them and said, Dad has something that he's taken care of. This is if you're in the hospital. And the medicine he takes makes him feel like himself again. Because the kids know, my kids all knew there was something even before I did. Like I did about my dad. Um, only I held a steady job so I didn't make that comparison immediately. But I have been very honest with my kids since 2007. So they weren't, one was going to St. John's, my son. Um, one was still in high school or she just started college. But they were at the age where it made sense to them that I needed help. Everybody needs help. And this is how I get my help. And my 20 year old daughter now, when she was, her name's Caroline, when she was in high school just a few years ago, she, <clears throat> Sorry. They were, her class was asked to uh, write a story about um, an unexpected leader, and she wrote about me. She still hasn't let me read it. <laughs> Not surprising, right? But she is the one that's home you know, when she's not at college. So she's the one, even last night, she asked me if I was down. I was just tired, but I said, no honey, but thank you so much for asking. When I'm up, she will say, dad, I think you're a little up right now. <laughs> Quiet the hell down. <laughs> <laughs> she, so they're very comfortable out talking about it because we were comfortable right away. My wife was right out of the gate. And my wife, by the way, God bless her soul, she is, we've been married uh, 
34 years in June, 50 to her, and she knows in the morning, like on the weekend, we'll do old people things, like do the crossword puzzle and drink coffee, and I will walk across the kitchen floor, and she can tell by my gait, by my pitter-patter on the floor, are you okay? She knows by my cadence if I'm up or what's normal <laughs> for me. So she's been my biggest supporter, obviously. I don't know how. I would have left me a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> but um, she's, she's just amazing. She works at Shriners Hospital, by the way. Yes? Well, I use my, seriously, I use my support system when I really need them and when I don't think I need them, they're there. I exercise, um, I run, I, like, I love to run, and I can't believe I'm saying this, my wife got me into doing heat yoga, <laughs> which if you've never done it, kicks your behind. <laughs> that is so awesome. So I do those two things, and especially the running I've done since I was a teenager, but the yoga thing has really come to really help me, I think, clear my mind. Because you're in that room, all you hear is the, what is that big long instrument called they have in India? Sitar. The sitar, thank you. You hear that sitar and that's all, and you can just zone. So I think exercise is important. I don't drink because I don't think it's smart. I take a, um, I take a stabilizer. Why would I want to destabilize with alcohol? So I choose not to drink. Um, my recommendation to people who have this is not to drink because it doesn't, doesn't do you any good. I sleep when I can, and I like to take a half hour nap in the afternoon when I get home. So there is a regimen there. I eat pretty well, but I love canned frosting. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a spoon and some Betty Crocker. <laughs> um, so I generally keep a good, a good nutritional um, uh, menu, but uh, that's it really. Does that answer? Okay. okay. Yes. Had a comment. I was just gonna say when I ran my first marathon in I think it was '99 Twin Cities. That I was looked me. over. I was like, <laughs> Cap Barlow. Like we crossed it almost the same time. So don't say that. <laughs> it was my first. So my daughter would absolutely kick me in the butt for saying this. I'm a man. I'm supposed to beat you, and I say that jokingly, oh, knowing no. <laughs> that any given woman in here could kick my butt. Probably will at anything. So anyways, yeah. That's and, funny. And, yeah. Thank you for sharing your story. You're welcome. So you finished in under three, which is what my goal is. <laughs> oh, under four. Well, see, it's been so long, I'm going to make the story better. Yeah, I did it in under three. She did it in under four. <laughs> Told you I was better. <laughs> see, guys have to make that up. <laughs> yes? Did you find it was difficult to... Uh, find the right medications for yourself? Or you said you started on lithium and you're still on lithium? I am, I am on lithium still. I was off it for a while because I felt like it was making me gain weight and I've got this thing about, this TV puts 10 pounds on you. <laughs> so we're all very vain about that. So I felt like it was making me gain weight so I got off it for a while and I realized how dumb that was and got back on. Um, I'm also on some other stuff um, Tegretol, Wellbutrin, a bunch of other things, but the, the answer to your question is it's always changing. Mm -hmm. Not only is uh, the medication prone to change, but the dosage is bound to change. And that's one of the most frustrating things about this. And you feel sorry for yourself sometimes because you think, what do I have to do to, to get under control here with this medication. Three of these, no, now it's one of these. Four of those, no, now it's six of these. 
So it's ongoing. It, it always changes, and that's another thing I tell people. Don't, I mean, I can't say don't get frustrated, because I do, but don't give up, because it does work out, and you'll get in this stretch of stability. I'm a, I'm a rapid cycler, which means that I go up and down a lot, um, sometimes in a couple of days, but mostly I'll have, like March for me was very flat, which was great on my scale that I do. I do a zero to five to minus five. Plus five means I'm really manic. Zero means I'm balanced. Minus five means I'm in bed and can't get up. So usually I hold myself there, but occasionally I'll get these little blips like a heart, like a heartbeat, only for a couple of days. But there are instances where I can point to it happening. Like when my son got married, I knew it was going to be emotionally really hard. And I prepared for it. And I thought about it a lot, and I told my doctor. He increased one medication just to be sure, to stabilize, and it worked. So you get to know, you get to know yourself. My doctor calls me hypervigilant, because I'm very aware of my ups and downs. But yeah, it's, medicine is always changing. I'm just curious, the physical, Part of it I wasn't aware of for bipolar. What caused you to actually be in the hospital for in a coma for a week? It was exhaustion. I was so I was so high. I was running on an hour's worth of sleep a night. I was doing a high stress job. I was doing evening television in Boston, which is a number seven market, which is huge. My home my hometown is Rhode Island, but my mom could see me. You know all these little things. They really do add up. Um, so I wasn't sleeping. I didn't want to take any kind of sleep aid because, you know, I don't need that crap. And I did need that or something. I was just so over the edge and so high that they had to pump me full of, they had to try all different kinds of medicine to bring me down. So I was just exhaustion brought on by the mania. Yes. Ken, this was super powerful, and it's been a privilege to hear your story, and I know others in the room would share my feeling that you've changed our lives today, sharing what you've shared. That's really nice, thank uh, you. In terms of kind of practical advice for people who are working or who are friends with someone who has uh, bipolar disorder and other mental illness, what, what has been helpful to you or maybe not so helpful as folks have interacted with you in your journey? Um, have, you people, have you guys heard of Rusty Gatenby? Yeah. He used to be on Five. Yeah. I worked yeah. with him for just a little while when I first got there. Humor, for me, is what helps. Because when that newspaper article first came out um, in the St. Paul Pioneer Press, the next day was a Monday, and I remember sitting at my desk thinking, okay, who's gonna come in, who's gonna come in? And in comes Rusty. <laughs> I was thinking, oh my God, what's gonna happen, what's gonna happen? He said, oh, there's a nut bag. <laughs> I said, thank you. Because everybody had been doing this all day. It's a terrible thing to say, but it's about me, it's okay. Um, so it's humor for me. I think most people just don't want people walking on eggshells around them. I mean, I've heard that from other people too. Just, you know, it's like the, um, it's like the, uh, what do you call it? It's something in the room, what's it called? Thank you. That's age, not the medicine. <laughs> um, it's like the elephant in the room. Okay, let's just, if you want to say anything, go ahead. Let's laugh about this. It's part of my life, it's okay. You know me, I laugh at everything. So let's laugh about it, and we do. I mean, I laugh at their shit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My former life, I was a sailor.
<laughs> well, it is, but it isn't because you know it's like it's like everything else. Here's here's my analogy to that. It's if I broke my leg and you were up there, and I said, "Hey, wait up! Would you wait?" The answer yes. <laughs> <laughs> Not me personally. I just mean a person. Well, if somebody's struggling um, and you can tell that they're down, especially, don't be afraid to say something and wait for them to get something that they need to get done done. Just be a little more patient like you were for me when I was hobbling up to you with my cast on. So if you're patient, and I know it just sounds so, so standard and understanding, because most people in this room, just because you're here, you understand. So, whether or not you want to say anything about the actual depression is, is different. But what I would say is, how are you feeling today? Are you okay today? It's that elephant in the room. And thank you for that. Um, or whatever you want to call it. Because that person, me, would much rather have you say something than say nothing. Because to me, even though you're the most loving guy, not saying something to me is almost hurtful in, a, in an odd, kind of an obtuse way. Does that make sense? And you would ask me how I am with my broken leg too, so why not? If you, if you think somebody's down, and you don't even know, you would say, hey, you okay today? It shouldn't change if you know that they have depression or something. So we're in Minnesota, and we're always okay. <laughs> you betcha. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your story. This may be a, a little bit of a repeat of what you've been asked, but I guess I'm asking for more specifics. As you get above and below that zero mark, what is the way the people closest to you set boundaries with you in a healthy way and positive way for you? Well, my wife has seen me off the scale high when I've done, I'll tell you this, the dumbest thing I've done is we lived near Rush Creek Golf Course in Maple Grove. We don't live on the course. We live near it. And Randy Shaver has his golf dinner from his fundraiser, I think it's a Sunday night, whatever night it is, I decided when I was up one time, I'm gonna go to Randy's, he invited me. And Teresa was like, are you sure? And we didn't know yet that this was the case, that I was manic, but I sure was because I drove over there. I walked in the door, Randy goes, Barlow, gave me a hug. I sat down and bought a $5,000 pool table. I don't play pool. <laughs> I don't have $5,000 to spend on a pool table or anything. And I saw nothing wrong with it. I was okay with that. So if you see behavior like that, spending is one of the behaviors that you'll notice and, and pe may notice in people that have mania. mania. Um, also, just doing things that aren't quite them. Like, um, I used to be a gymnast when I was young. So I can still walk on my hands even though I'm old. And I was out doing that in the yard and Teresa said, are you okay? <laughs> I said, for God's sakes, woman. No, I said, I said, I'm fine. So when you see something a little out of the ordinary like that, you know, she knows if I'm having a glass of wine, something's really <coughs> wrong because I haven't had that in years. Little things like that, if you notice, that's when you step in and say, hey, what are you doing? Are you, are you feeling all right? What's going on? Is that what you mean? That kind of behavior? Behavior patterns for depression for me, I don't get sad, some people do. I just get, I don't care. I really don't care about anything. I just wanna lay in bed all day. Or as I did most recently, a couple months ago, on my living room floor with my two cats and dog, and I don't wanna do anything, that's it. So if you see that, obviously, there's something going on there. So then what do you do at that point? The, the person or, or me? Both. 
well, I will call my doctor because the recipe for my meds, he will adjust a few things, not take you off or put you on a new thing usually. He will adjust that to a point where you will start to feel better, but unfortunately with depression, as a lot of you know, it takes two weeks most of the time for an antidepressant. Depression for me is the worst because I don't get suicidal or anything like that. I just don't know how people that have depression do it. God bless you, whoever may have it in here, because that is so hard. To me, that is the biggest struggle. Because of mania, you're like, woohoo, and you're going and going and going, and when you're depressed, when I'm depressed, I don't want to do anything. Except call my doctor and say, oh my God, what do I do? You know. All right, we have time for about one more question. Oh. <laughs> Maybe two, we'll see how fast. I'll get to this. I was just wondering uh, when a person gets a chronic diagnosis or a chronic disease state, it's almost like you go through a grieving period. Yes. Because I, I, does that uh, still impact you, or you know, how did you get through that? The first one was anger, like it is usually with people. Then I went through all the steps of grieving. I'm so glad you brought this up. And my final one was acceptance. I said, you know, this beats the alternative. So let's do this. So that that hap that didn't happen until 2011, September of 2011, because it took me that long to get out of the castle and to feel better about myself. That's a great question, thank you. But you do go through the stages of grief, and acceptance is the most wonderful. It takes a while to get there. Is that it? Yes. You just mentioned in passing aging, and we serve a lot of people here at UCARE who are senior citizens. And are, and wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Don't put me on the gurney just yet. <laughs> oh, is this about somebody else? Okay. Let's, let's talk about a hypothetical person. Okay. Uh, what, what would you expect, or what do you know about about bipolar disease and how it how it will change, or how you will experience it as you age? Will it be different? Well, it will be different because there are there are a couple of things that I have found out. Um, the first one is somebody told me who doesn't have a mental illness. You know, if you have a mental illness, you have a 25 year less life expectancy. Well, thank you. <laughs> but the average there, as those of you who do this know, includes a lot of this, a lot of suicides and stuff like that. So I'm 56, so I think the, um, the age is 77, 78 for men, somewhere in the 70s or close to 80, so I'm there already. So <laughs> I'm okay now. Um, but I also noticed uh, memory because of some of the medications I take. It happened on the air a couple of times and it was, it was terrifying, so I got off that medicine. Um, but as far as the actual illness, I'm not sure what I'm in for because my dad, by the time I found out he had it, he passed. So I'm not, I'm not sure. It's a, it's a work in progress with me as I get older. I mean, that's the only thing I noticed. I, I feel good. Um, I can do pretty much anything that anybody else can do. You can walk on your hands? I can walk on my damn hands, come on. <laughs> And I'm 56. <laughs> thank you. That was nice of you. <laughs> okay, thank you guys very much. So, oh, thank you. My gosh. Oh, thank you guys. Thank you very much. That's really nice. So in the back of the room, there's still some of the Stop the Stigma um, bracelets, if any of you would like them. And remember that um, we support the NAMI Walk in the fall, and where we first heard Ken talk about this. I host actually. it a lot. Yeah. Yes. So um, part of why we do this is the awareness and that whole part about Stop the Stigma. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you again, everybody.